saw them putting on body armor. Undetected mental health issues and then just snapped. No, my brother's attacking my family. The following stories tell the tale of three children who did the unthinkable by taking the lives of members of their own family. The Bever family was made up of parents, David and April, and their seven children, who ranged in age from 18 years old all the way down to two. There were four boys and three girls. They were from a town called Broken Arrow in Oklahoma. All of the children were homeschooled by their parents, but were not known to interact with other homeschooled groups that were local to the area. At times, the kids would be seen playing in their backyard, but only with their siblings, not other neighborhood children. It appeared that the Bever parents were very productive and not willing to allow their children to interact with others. It was as if they were afraid of the dangers of the outside world. Despite the Bever parents seeming to not want their children to find out about aspects of the outside world, they strangely did not seem too worried about their internet use. The children had nearly full access to the internet, and there were multiple tablets and computers at their disposal. The older two boys, 18-year-old Robert and 16-year-old Michael, initially engaged in pretty normal internet use for their age. They liked researching things like Star Wars, different sports cars, and music. They also enjoyed playing the game Minecraft. Robert would also make a couple of his own personal vlogs where he would discuss different projects he was working on. He seemed motivated and excited about a skit he planned to soon release. I'm going to make my first skit soon. Can't show you a sneak preview or it would ruin it. It'll be like a minute long. It's, it's, it's going to be some good stuff. I think it's going to be hilarious. Unfortunately, Robert's interests would soon shift from more innocent things to quite disturbing topics. He became infatuated with the aspect of killing people and would research information about different serial killers. He was obsessed and couldn't get enough. His brother Michael looked up to him greatly and would do whatever he asked of him. Robert ended up confiding in Michael about how he wanted to kill people and soon the pair started sharing an interest in murder. The pair were fascinated by famous killers like the Columbine shooters, Ted Bundy, and Richard Ramirez. They longed to make a name for themselves by outdoing these killers and taking the lives of even more people than them. They discussed killing their own family members while recording and then later posting the video to YouTube. While they planned their deadly plot, they also became obsessed with a movie called Rampage. It's a violent film that came out in 2009. In it, the main character resents the world around them and feels the need to bring down the population and restore balance in the world. As a result, he takes on a self-given mission to kill as many people as possible. In the movie, this individual commits many murders and ultimately gets away with it, framing the crimes on his friend. It's an incredibly dark film and one that Robert and Michael ultimately got inspiration from. They wanted to begin by killing their own family and then move on and commit another killing spree somewhere miles away. The boys were truly serious about their intentions to kill their family and killing others. Robert purchased guns for them online. He then had them shipped to a local store where he planned to pick them up the day after the murder took place. He also ordered a huge amount of ammunition. He was actually bold enough to have this shipped to his family's house. The plan was that after they killed their family, they would then take the ammunition and weapons and steal their family car so they could travel to the location of the next killing. Michael would later explain to an investigator what he and Michael had been thinking at the time. We wanted to kill everyone in the house first, and then we would have all the packages to show up over the weekend. He began. He spoke in a cool, calm voice, as if he wasn't talking about committing a horrific murder. He explained that the first stop on their list would be Washington State. Michael had never learned how to drive, so he would be relying on Robert to get around. Strangely, the pair picked a time and a date based upon when the ammunition was expected to arrive. You know, all the ammunition? He didn't want them to see that, so we killed them the day before the ammunition came. Michael explained. In preparation for their killing quest, Robert took cash out of the bank so that they could use it while traveling. He also wrote all the details of the murder plan in a notebook, which he and Michael discussed ahead of time, point by point. They had planned for the killing spree to take place at night. They were going to wait until everyone slept before they began. They planned for their father to be the first target and then they would go from person to person until they had taken them all out. They planned to kill only their father with a crossbow and the others with a knife 
or a pistol. The way Michael emotionlessly described their plan is enough to send a shiver down anyone's spine. I would go upstairs and uh, shoot David, dad, in the eye with my crossbow, which would kill him, he said. Despite their careful preparations, nothing would end up going as they planned. The pair seemed to falsely believe that they would only have to stab someone once to kill them. But in reality, the murders would be more difficult. In a written confession that Michael would later give to the police, he explained that on the night of April 22nd, 2015, they waited until 12 a.m. They would then gather their gear. The plan was that he would kill their father, along with their 13-year-old sister, Crystal, their five-year-old sister, Victoria, and two-year-old, Autumn. And then Robert would kill their mother and their two younger brothers, 12-year-old Daniel and 7-year-old Chris. On the night of the murders, Robert and Michael would actually change up their initial plan. They ended up choosing Crystal as their first victim. Michael lured Crystal into the bedroom he shared with Robert by telling her that he wanted to show her something on the computer. When she entered the room, Robert attacked her. When Crystal didn't immediately die, Robert stabbed her again and again in both the neck and stomach. Despite Crystal's injuries, she was able to leave the room on foot yelling for someone to get their dad and call the police. Crystal would later end up telling a different story. She claimed that she was the one who entered the room voluntarily and that Michael hadn't come to get her. She went on to say that she saw her brothers preparing for their sinister mission and also saw a variety of knives lying on the bed. Before she had time to react to this strange scene, it was then that Michael distracted her with his computer while Robert attacked. Believing that her death would be quick and silent because that's how it appeared to him in the movies he had watched. Crystal ran away screaming, which alerted their mother, April, who came to see what was going on. When Robert was distracted by his mother, Crystal made it out of the house and onto the driveway. In the meantime, April is screaming for help while Robert s***ed her again and again. After Robert believed that April was dead, he ran outside to get Crystal and drag her from the driveway to the porch, likely afraid that her screams would alert the neighbors of what was going on. He then ran back inside and told Michael to bring Crystal the rest of the way into the house so he could go on to finish off the rest of the family. Michael managed to get Crystal into the entryway of the home where he left her before locking the door behind him. When Robert re-entered the house, he would find that both Victoria and Christopher had locked themselves in a bathroom out of fear. They were not certain what was going on, but they needed to protect themselves. Michael approached the door and tricked them by saying that Robert was the only attacker and they needed to let him in the bathroom so he could hide too. Christopher believed his older brother and opened the door for him. When he did, Michael entered the bathroom and stabbed both of his siblings to death. Meanwhile, Daniel, just 12 at the time, had already come up with a plan to get help. He locked himself into his father's office, the room right next to the bathroom, where Victoria and Christopher had been hiding. He then used his father's phone to call 911. In the 911 transcript, Daniel can be heard whispering the word help before giving the dispatcher the address of the home. He would then go on to say, my brother's attacking my family. When the dispatcher asks questions trying to understand what's going on, Daniel suddenly stops responding and yelling can be heard in the background. Seconds later, it's Michael that answers the phone by saying hello. Just as Michael had tricked Chris and Victoria, he also tricked Daniel by getting him to open the door. When he did, Robert attacked and s Daniel dozens of times, eventually killing him. Meanwhile, 52-year-old David Bever had been asleep upstairs this whole time, unaware of what was going on. When the chaos became loud enough to wake him up, he raced downstairs to the very disturbing, violent scene. He lunged at Robert, hoping to keep him from hurting anyone else, but he was unarmed while Robert carried a knife. Robert managed to stab his father in the chest, and after David fell to the ground, he began to stab him again and again until he died. He stabbed him approximately 28 different times, not only in the neck, but in the torso, face, arm, and hand. At this point, Michael and Robert believed they had finished the job of killing everyone. They seemed to have forgotten their baby sister, Autumn, who was sleeping upstairs at the time. They were planning out their next move when there was a sudden knock at the door. Not knowing if it was the police or a neighbor, both Michael and Robert decided not to answer it. Instead, they grabbed a pre-packed backpack and ran out the back door and kept running until they reached the woods. It was, in fact, 
fact the police who had knocked at the door. While standing on the porch, they heard a very weak voice inside the house asking for help. They ended up breaking down the door and going inside. They immediately saw Crystal, who was lying in the entryway, gravely injured. It was clear she didn't have much time, and it was a wonder that she was even alive at all. Paramedics quickly arrived at the scene, and Crystal was rushed to a hospital where she was treated for her severe wounds. Remarkably, she managed to survive. Meanwhile, as police began to investigate the scene of the crime, they would find all of the dead bodies that had been left behind. The house was covered in gore and looked as if it was the set of a horror movie. They passed dead body after dead body as they made their way through the house. When they got upstairs, they found little Autumn in her bed. At first, she didn't appear to be moving, and they were worried that she was also harmed. However, upon taking a closer look, they would discover that the little girl was only sleeping and likely had been sleeping throughout the entire ordeal. Had the knock at the door not happened at that exact time, she likely would have suffered the incredible torture and abuse that her brothers had planned for her. The back door was left open, so the police knew that the boys had likely gone out that way. Through the use of police canines, they were able to track both Robert and Michael down quickly. They asked them to put their hands in the air, which Robert did immediately, but Michael hesitated, and the police released a canine, which tackled them to the ground. Both Michael and Robert looked horrific when they were found. They were covered in gore and looked as if they had just stepped out of a horror movie. They were both arrested and taken into police custody. In Michael's mugshot, he appeared to be vacant while Robert shockingly had a smile on his face. He looked as though he was proud of what he had just done. Initially, Michael tried to change the story of what went down that night. He claimed everything had been Robert's idea and he just stood around and watched. He claimed he didn't intervene because Robert had threatened to kill him, but eventually, as the police pressed him. He confessed to stabbing Christopher, but only one time. Investigators did not believe him and pressed on. Every stab wound that you inflicted, we're going to know about, and this is your last chance to let us know. To be honest, to man up, and tell us exactly what you did and start making it right. Michael doesn't admit to stabbing anyone else besides Christopher. However, when police spoke with Robert, he told the whole story and explained which deaths Michael was responsible for. Both Michael and Robert would eventually be charged with five counts of first-degree murder and one count of assault and battery with a deadly weapon. They initially pleaded not guilty. Michael's lawyer tried to get him tried as a juvenile, but because he was facing a murder charge, state law required that he be charged as an adult. While in police custody, Robert did attempt to take his own life one time by tying a bed sheet around his neck, but his attempt was unsuccessful. He would eventually plead guilty and wound up being sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He didn't appear to be very sorry, and at one point, he could even be seen smiling while in court. District Attorney Steve Hunsweiler believes that Robert deserved the death penalty for what he did, but did not want to put the surviving victims through that. The determining factor for me was I have a surviving teenage young girl and a toddler. Those children deserve a life, and I'm not going to saddle them with what I know the reality of a death penalty case to be, he said in court. Michael would later be called in to take the stand at his brother's trial. He said for a while the plan wasn't real, it was just something he said to make him feel better, a reporter recalled of what Robert contributed. Michael would ultimately be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. To give him life without parole, they would have to find that he is beyond any hope of rehabilitation for the rest of his life. And the jurors said they did not find that, so that is why they chose a sentence of life five counts of life, a reporter on the scene explained. Both Autumn and Crystal Bever were adopted into the same home. Meanwhile, both Michael and Robert remain behind bars. Nehemiah Gracia was born on March 20th, 1997 in Albuquerque, New Mexico. His parents were very religious and they practiced the Christian faith. Nehemiah was one of seven children and the apple of his parents' eye. He was a talented athlete and a musician. He went to church regularly and even volunteered. Every sign pointed towards him enjoying a positive future. He wanted to go into the army, just like his dad, Greg. Greg had a rough start to his life and got caught up in substance abuse. He even spent some time in prison. However, he ended up turning things around and finding God. He would eventually become the pastor of a church called the Calvary Chapel. He was well known around the community for advocating for children, giving inspirational talks at the prison, and even volunteering at the homeless shelter. Greg's wife, Sarah, played a big role in his conversion. She grew up highly religious and also frequently volunteered for the community. From the outside looking in, it seemed as if they had the ideal family, but there may have been things 
things going on that the public didn't know about, especially early on in Nehemiah's life. Later brain scans would show that Nehemiah had suffered some sort of abuse when he was younger that affected his brain. It was also possible that he struggled with some sort of mental health disorder like schizophrenia. Nehemiah would also later allege that his parents were very strict and mentally abusive by keeping the kids on a rigid daily schedule. In time, he would begin to resent his parents and this resentment would turn to anger and would eventually reach a breaking point. On the night of January 19th, 2013, Nehemiah got into a big argument with his mother. She would end up sending him to bed early. He was 15 years old at the time. As the hours went by, he tossed and turned, unable to fall asleep. His anger was growing and growing until he could control it no longer. He eventually crept out of his room, made his way to his parents' room, and quietly opened the closet. He took out a 22 caliber, scoped, rifle. At the time, Nehemiah's mother and little brother, Zephaniah, were asleep in the bedroom, while his little sisters, Angelina and Yal, were asleep down the hall. Nehemiah hit his mother in the head, killing her instantly. Zephaniah woke up confused and startled. When he asked what was going on, Nehemiah told him that he had killed their mother. At first, he didn't believe him, but then upon showing him the evidence, the child began screaming and crying. Even though Nehemiah had previously only been mad at his mother, he would end up shooting and killing Zephaniah too. He would then walk across the hall where his little sisters were. They had both been awoken by all the noise and were scared. He would then shoot and kill them both. Horrifically, he would then return to the bedroom where his mother and baby brother lay dead. He took a picture of his mother's body, which he would later send to the girl he was dating at the time. He lied to her and said that she had been killed in an accident. He would then return to the little girl's room and them many more times in order to ensure that they were dead. After massacring his whole family, Nehemiah took his weapon and went downstairs. It was there he sat for five hours until his father returned home. That night, Greg had been working the night shift at the homeless shelter, so he didn't arrive home until 5 a.m. As soon as he walked in the door, Nehemiah shot and killed him. Once he had finished this grisly task, Nehemiah then took his weapon and ammo and packed them into the car. He planned to continue his killing spree with his next targets being his girlfriend's parents. He also wanted to shoot up a Walmart. But his next move was so unpredictably shocking that no one could have suspected it. The next morning, he went to a mass at the same church where his dad worked, and his family was well known. Many people who knew the family found it strange he was alone, and his whole family was strangely absent. Meanwhile, Nehemiah's girlfriend had passed along the news that members of his family had been in some sort of accident. The current pastor of the church became concerned and eventually decided to drive back to the house with Nehemiah and check on his family. While driving there, the pastor, who happened to be a retired police officer, had a hunch that something was terribly wrong and called 911. It wouldn't be long after that Nehemiah was arrested and taken into custody. Initially, when he was first questioned by police, Nehemiah lied and said that he had been away at a friend's house for a couple of days and returned home to find that his family had been killed. He said that the reason he didn't call 911 was because he was in shock and not thinking straight. But as time went on, he confessed to the killings and admitted that he was dealing with the thoughts of taking his own life, but was often angry at his family members too. Nehemiah was charged with five counts of murder, but because he was a child at the time of the killings and had mental health problems as proven by his brain scans, Judge John J. Romero of the New Mexico Children's Court ruled that he could be rehabilitated and be released on the day of his 21st birthday. The state did not agree and appealed the decision. Nehemiah would face a judge for the second time in August of 2019. For the first time, he spoke aloud in court and apologized to his older surviving siblings who had not been at the house the night that the killings took place. I am sorry for taking our parents and our kids. You know, I wish I could take it back, but reality is that we can't. I want no retaliation. I love you guys, and I want to see the best for y'all. And whatever you may do, and I do pray for you guys to have healing the way I'm having healing. He also addressed an aunt and uncle, some of the very few individuals associated with the family that were in favor of him ever leaving prison. Nobody's ever shown me that kind of mercy and that kind of compassion the way you guys have. And I'm so damn grateful for you guys. Then, addressing his uncle specifically, Nehemiah said something that would cause his sister to break down in tears. He's been a second father to me. 
in the fall that I wish I had. His sister then stormed out of the courtroom. He then addressed the judge and told her that there was still hope for him if he was allowed to ever be released from prison. Even the worst of us can make progress. Even the ones that have been through hell and back can still make it he told her. Nehemiah's older sister Vanessa did not agree that he should be released from prison. She also explained how she never saw this coming. For me, I never really saw any signs because I thought that he was just a rebellious teenager that wanted to do whatever he wanted, she said. Ultimately, Judge Alyssa Hart would agree that Nehemiah should not be released from prison anytime soon. She gave him three life sentences along with seven years. Today, he remains behind bars. Antonio Armstrong Jr., known as AJ, came from a loving, normal family. He had one older brother and sister. He was a former NFL player who ran a successful chain of gyms and worked as a professional motivational speaker. Both of his parents were hardworking, and their hard work paid off, allowing them to live a nice lifestyle and provide everything for their children. The family enjoyed nice vacations, drove luxurious cars, and the children attended private school. It seemed as if they had everything. Unfortunately, on July 29th of 2016, everything would change. That night, while AJ's parents, Antonio and Don, were asleep, they were ahead and killed. AJ, who was just 16 years old at the time, would later be charged for their deaths, while all three children, including AJ, his brother Joshua, and his sister Kayra, had been home the night of the shooting. Kayra had been asleep at the time it occurred, and AJ was the one who called 911. A security alarm that had been set to protect the house had not gone off, signifying that whoever killed Mr. and Mrs. Armstrong had been inside the house. Police suspected AJ was the killer, and he was arrested. Police located a pistol within the home that they believed was used in the killing, and they tested it for fingerprints. AJ's fingerprints were not found on it. Nevertheless, prosecutors believed he was responsible. They also pointed to a sensor detecting movement occurring in the path between AJ's bedroom and his parents' bedroom just 30 minutes before he dialed 911. In AJ's 911 call, he tells the dispatcher that he heard gunfire, and when he went to investigate, he discovered his parents' dead bodies. While the audio transcription of this 911 call was not released to the public, a transcription of it was. AJ reportedly appeared confused when asked what type of gun he believed had heard go off. I'm not good with guns, but I guess like a, I don't know, 15 or something like that. I know my dad has a gun underneath the, God, where does he keep the gun? Um, I think he keeps it in this drawer right next to his bed, he said. In the weeks and months following the killings, investigators delved into many text messages shared between AJ and his parents to see what sort of tension could have existed leading up to what happened. As it turned out, AJ was hardly in good favor with his parents. He hadn't been doing well in school and they were disappointed in him. He had been skipping classes and failing to turn in assignments. AJ, bro, I just don't get it. Zeros, missing assignments, emails from teachers. I'm tired, really tired. Nothing left to say. AJ's father says in one particularly fed up text. One text coming from his mom was even harsher. We gave you all and the best we had. We wanted the best for you. We provided the best education, bought you a car to celebrate you. We tried to be open with you and what was important to you. And all you do is lie to us, scheme behind our backs, choose to piss on all we do, beyond disappointed. I will never understand why you are a liar and do not work hard in school. You don't want to be right or do good. I'm so heartbroken, but this is what it is, she wrote. The first trial against AJ was deemed a mistrial, and he was ultimately released from prison after paying bail. He has been living with his grandmother and caring for his own son, a baby named Hendrix. To this day, AJ continues to maintain his innocence. In a viral interview with a reporter, he discussed what life has been like since he was accused of killing his own parents. He sobbed throughout the interview. It's not even the fact of just dealing with not having my parents anymore. It's the fact that I'm being accused of something of this magnitude. His defense claims that AJ is not behind his parents' deaths, but rather an intruder is. I'm innocent. There was somebody else in that house that night, and to know that this is something I'm being accused of just makes everything so much worse. He went on. AJ would continue on to explain just how horrific jail was for him during the eight months he stayed there prior to his eventual release. Jail was very, very hard. I mean, I many sleepless nights, just not being able to be around my family. I mean, only having 10 minute phone calls a week. Like it was just hard and hearing my little sister on the phone, like it was just, 
tough to deal with. Not long after AJ bonded out of jail, the case would take a major twist. The defense would end up requesting that the case against AJ be dismissed on account that there was evidence that the prosecution had failed to share with them. Part of this alleged evidence was tied to Maxine Adams, a friend of both Don and Antonius. When Maxine took the stand in court, she claimed that she knew that Antonio was tied to an illegal crime ring that involved services with women. She also alleged that he had received death threats. Many involved with the investigation believed that this was enough to clear AJ's name. You mean to tell me that wasn't enough for you to start investigating? It's painful, but I want to know truth and I want my grandson free. Whatever it takes to free my grandson, I just want the truth and I want everybody involved to do their job. AJ's next case is expected to occur in January of 2022. In the meantime, he will remain free.